Listen to this interview when Steven talks about when he told his dad he was going to be an artist and what happened next. Also, what was the product that hit it big at a time when he felt he wasn't pulling his weight around the house? Listen up also towards the end when he talks about how he did things differently at a 7-Eleven, which allowed him to get a greater distribution. That and much more coming up next. <laughs> Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Stephen Key. He's author of One Simple Idea for Startups and Entrepreneurs from McGraw-Hill. He's developed and licensed over 20 products. Just wait till you hear what he has in store for us today. Stephen Key was able to land a three-year worldwide exclusive deal with Disney, allowing his company to stock guitar picks with Disney images in Walmart and 7-Eleven, and eventually leading to an endorsement by the famous musician Taylor Swift, and a whole lot more. So, Stephen, thanks for joining us. You know, you're the perfect person to talk to us about how do you go from that idea to making that first sale or dollar and beyond? Because we get a lot of comments about people who have tons of ideas, they don't know where to start, or they have a current product or service and they're trying to get traction and it's really hard for them. So thank you for spending the time right now. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And I always like to include a fun fact before we get started on some of these great questions is that most people wouldn't know about just Steven is he's severely dyslexic. He can never get phone numbers right, and he has had to hide that for his whole life since the second grade. That's not a fun fact, but that's very true, and uh, it, it's been difficult, but yes, it's true, and I think you can get over overcome anything. Yeah. I, I'm a good example. Of that. And you know, like, there's probably a lot of people out there who have something they consider to be like a disability they've had struggle with, so it's, you know, just the sharing not the, I don't know, we'll call it a fun fact for now, but a fact that most people don't know. Um, but the first question I had for you was, you have so many ideas and so many products. Tell us about one of those ideas, how you came up with it, and how you knew it was worth it to pursue in the end. Okay. Um, let's start with hot picks, guitar picks. Okay. Uh, I had a good friend. His name was Rob Stefani. He came by my office one day. He wasn't doing anything, and, and of course, I had a business that kind of fell apart. And he came by and he said, Steve, why don't we do something with the guitar pick? And I'm like, Rob, why a guitar pick? They've been around for 50 years. No one cares. But he said, look, I think there's an opportunity here. So I started designing guitar picks. And I don't play a guitar, but I had fun with it. And I think that's what innovation is all about, having fun with it. So I came up with these uh, fun girl-shaped uh, guitar picks. And that was my inspiration because rock and roll and girls and, you know, the rest is history. So that's what I, I that's one of the first ideas I came up with. So how did you know that was the one? Because you probably get a, come a lot, you come up with a lot of ideas by yourself or they come across your desk. How did you know that was the one you were going to run with? I didn't know. Um, I knew that um, Rob, my partner, knew the business because he had a couple stores. Mm -hmm. And he thought these ideas were great, and I thought they were great. So we went ahead, and we, we all thought they were great. But they, they weren't that great. In fact, we, we couldn't sell them. So we went to all this work, we couldn't sell them. And I had to kind of step back and take some of the lessons that I've been trying to teach people and, and really get input from the people I'm selling my product to. And those were kids. Yeah. So I, I didn't know. And I don't think a lot of us know. But... But when we did change it, when we changed the shapes to skulls, it was a hit instantly. That's I want you to, we'll save that. I want you to talk more about that later, um, of how you decided to change it and why. But um, tell me, why did he come to you? What was your background and how'd you know to even how to design guitar picks? I mean, no one's gonna come to me and ask me to design anything. How, why'd he come to you? You know, he, he, he knew that um, I, was a product developer okay. and I've known him since he was eight years old and so he came by and he came by my office and he saw all this fun stuff and he we knew we actually had a mutual friend that was selling one guitar pick in the shape of an alien that was selling a lot of them and he thought well if he could do this Steve could come up with something better than that right and so I looked at it it was a challenge I thought well why and it was just a creative challenge 
And it didn't, we didn't start off thinking we're going to create this business. I just had fun. But it slowly changed very quickly when I thought, hmm, maybe we have something here. So what are some of the other things before, obviously he knew you've been creating things. What's something in the past you've created that he was like, wow, like I need to go to Steven with this idea? Well, I took a basketball game. I, I, I went down to the store and I looked at all the bas- indoor basketball games because I wanted to um, have something to do while I was coming up with ideas. And I went down to Toys R Us and I looked at all the basketball games and the backboards were so boring I thought I've got to do something fun, so I took I took one home and I loved Michael Jordan. I took a poster, I cut it up and slapped it on the backboard, put it on my wall, and had a blast. And I eventually showed that to a company called Ohio Art, and they licensed that idea from me, and it sold for ten years. And it was such a simple idea. So Rob had seen me take little things and change them to make them fun. So he knew I had that ability to do that. Yes. Yeah. And before we get into some of those success stories, tell us one of those moments where it didn't feel so successful. Maybe one of those down and out moments where you didn't know what the future was going to hold. Do you remember one of those? I've had, what do you mean one? I I have a lot of those. Uh, I'm going to start at the very beginning. When I was in college, I was uh, at Santa, uh, Santa Clara University. I was a business major and it wasn't the right fit. So... I took an art class by uh, chance, and I I went home and I told my dad I want to be an artist. And he said, well, that's really great. Do you paint? And I said, well, no. He goes, well, do you draw? I said, no. And he was, I know he was thinking, what are you doing with your life? But I I changed careers, and I went over to San Jose State University and became an art student. And I realized that wasn't the right place for me either. So I left early without a degree. And just started making things and selling them at street fairs for seven years. So what's something that you made to give us an idea early uh, on? I, I needed to make something very fast. And I, was, I, want, I thought I was a sculptor. That's what I was wanting to train in. So I took a nylon. Um, I bought them at Mervyn's. And I'll give you an example. I, I would purchase red nylons and stuff them with cotton and sew a little face on it and, and make a little smiling tomato. Okay. And I'd make vegetables. I called them softies, and I sold them uh, at street fairs. Huh. I could make them quick, and if it didn't sell, I, I didn't make that particular product. But I learned some very important lessons back then, that if it didn't sell, find, come up with something very quick. Yeah. And it's easy to do, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. So every, every Saturday, I, I either would, would be able to uh, make the rent or not make the rent. So I knew. So I had a lot of failure. Right. But, you learn from it. You learn. What was the time later on, like when you had, I know you have kids, when you had kids to support, what was one of those moments that you remember? I, I was um, I was very fortunate because I, I met this wonderful um, woman at World's Wonder and she had a great job and we moved to a very small town and she was supporting me. And But I didn't like that. So I started to design stuffed animals for companies and my business took off a little bit and uh, eventually she was able to quit her job and uh, I took over supporting the whole family and one of my products hit big and everything changed. Which one was that? Uh, that was a, a rotating label, it was a spin label. Okay. And I remember, um, you know, my wife was the breadwinner, which never feels great and we had three kids and I wasn't pulling my weight. And I remember this wasn't going to last long. My wife was probably going to kick me to the curb pretty quick if I didn't come up with something. But sure enough, I came up with an idea that was a big moneymaker. And she ended up quitting Gallo and uh, everything changed. Even my whole career changed because of it. What about one of those times with the licenses when you, I think you'd mentioned when you're trying to get into bigger chains, it, it sometimes felt impossible. Do you remember one of those times? Yes, yeah, all the time. Um, <clears throat> I would say we were selling guitar picks, and we were selling guitar picks at all the local small guitar shops. Yeah. But I, I wanted to sell them to the big chains, and I knew that was going to be difficult. But I knew our product could sell outside the traditional mainstream music stores, and everybody said I was crazy. 
So I said, no, I, I think our guitar picks would sell at 7-Eleven. Everybody said, well, why do you think guitarists visit 7-Eleven? I said, that's, that's not the point. People were collecting our guitar picks that didn't even play. So I went to, down to the local guitar, uh, local 7-Eleven and talked the store manager in to putting my display up for just a couple days. And, and his manager said, get this out of here. It will never sell. But the manager is very kind. And I said, I'll be back in two days. We put it in there. I went back and the counter, my display was gone. Oh. And I went back and I said, well, how did they do? And I thought they didn't do, do very well. They took them away. And he said, Steve, we sold out of every one. We need more. And that's when I went and, and realized sometimes you just have to do things a little differently. If I had gone to corporate 7-Eleven in Dallas, they would have said no. By going down to the local store and talking to the manager, he gave me an opportunity. And that's what it's all about at times. You have to kind of think things through a little differently. Right. We went from one store to, to 10 stores. The regional manager called us and said, you've got a hot product, um, unbelievable. And sure enough, then we um, were able to get major distribution with 7-Eleven. So how did you know that um, people were collecting them and not just using them? Because it seems like you're really in touch with the customer. How did you even know that? Well, we, when we first came out with the designs, we couldn't sell them. Um, they were my designs and I was wrong. Uh, then I went down and I studied the marketplace. I went down to the mall and I went down to a hot topic and I looked around and I thought, what's this 50 year old guy doing in a place like that? And, but I noticed that they had all these skulls everywhere and I couldn't figure it out, but I thought, why are kids buying these skulls? So I went back, redesigned a skull guitar pick and took it to a trade show. And I told my partner, I said, why don't we just throw all these guitar picks on the table? And we did, and it created a mob because I gave them away for free. And it created so many people wanted them that the buyers couldn't even get to us. And that's when I realized we had a big hit on our hands. And those were the skulls, the, one, the guitar picks with the skulls on it. It was a hit instantly, and the kids loved it. But you know how I knew the skull was going to work? Before we even made the skull, because it was $3,000 for a mold, and I wanted to test the market a little bit, I put, I put these um, surveys in music stores, and I told the, the, the guy behind the counter, if you fill out these surveys, I'll give you $20 for a stack, and anybody that fills it out, I'll give them free guitar picks when we make them. And so we picked them up from five different guitar picks, and I still have all that information. I really love it. And they all picked the skull. <laughs> really, all of them? All of them did. And we had we had twenty designs, but it was all it was like five designs, and it was always the skull. So we let the market tell us what it wanted. Now I thought I was a pretty good designer, but I was wrong. But but I, the kids said this is what we wanted, and so we made those. And sure enough, they were they were right. They were. We went to the trade show. It was it was amazing what happened. So always listen to your customer. Yeah. What absolutely. were the other designs on there that you thought was going to hit a big that you were surprised didn't get chosen? Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know. We had everything from vampires that were very popular to we had um, my partner was a very religious uh, person. He didn't want us to put a devil pick. What we did that sold very, very well. Um, but some of the other ones that maybe were a little off, like we did um, dogs, like mean bulldogs, pit bulls, things like that. People didn't like that. But they liked the zombies, the monsters. We did Frankenstein. Mm. We did skulls. Everything that was a little bit dark and a little bit heavy metal. Um, and they loved it. But we ended up branching out to doing Mickey Mouse and Taylor Swift and everybody. So we, we started in a very small niche and became very successful. And then we... we we went broad and it worked. We had a guitar pick for, for every lifestyle. We sold tens of millions of them. I had everybody calling us. Really about a piece of plastic. I mean, I was surprised that such a simple change to an existing product that's been around for forever could create such a passion and a collective. All the kids collected them. Most kids never played. They just collected them and they had you know, all our designs. Yeah, it's amazing. What was another one that you remember that more one of the first big licensing deals um, where you licensed the technology? Do you remember one of those? Yeah. Talk about. 
Yeah, I, I was I was reading the paper. I was living in Modesto about how there was never enough information on containers, and I had this one product that I had licensed to the Disney stores. It was basically a a, a, a plastic cup that you could spin it, and many many would change outfits. It was just <laughs> fun for kids. And I thought, well, that might be kind of interesting, a way to deliver more information on labels. So I went down to my office. My office at the time was Kinko's. I went down there. You had a little drawer that said Stephen Key. I went down there. And, and I went to Walmart, and I grabbed a product, and off, I tore the label off, and I made a rotating label. And I knew I hit something big. I, I knew it. I saw it. I brought it home. I showed it to my wife. My wife at the time was vice president of marketing for Gala Winery. Uh, and she knew a lot about new products. She saw it, and she was like, this is, this is pretty wild. And that was, that was when um, sometimes your gut just says you're, you're on to something. But then you have to prove it, right? So what did I do? My wife said, well, what are you going to do now? And I said, well, I'm going to call this, the company that I made the label. And I said, Steve, you, you, they won't take your call. I said, well, why is that? Because, well, that's McNeil. You know, that, that's Johnson & Johnson. They won't take a call from a guy that works at a Kinko. There's not in a million years. So sure enough, I, 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 in the very next day, I got on the phone and I called a few people. And sure enough, someone picked up in the graphics department. And I said, I've got this rotating label. And they said, what does it do? And can you send me a sample? I sent that sample I made at Kinko's. He picked up the phone three days later and said, Steve, I love this. Do you have a patent on it? Once again, the customer told me what they wanted, and sure enough, it was um, it was it's been a uh, one of my businesses that I'm still very much involved in, even after 15 years. So yes. So when they asked you, do you have a patent on it? Did you get a patent on it? I mean, something that you create like that, you want to make sure it works before you spend all the money and get lawyers and patent it. What do you <clears throat> what do you do in that situation? I panicked. I, I didn't know what to do. In fact, I think a lot of us do that. Looking back, I probably did um, the same thing everybody does. I picked, I picked the phone right away, called an attorney, and started filing patents without doing my homework. And sure enough, um, uh, later I found out, and I can tell you the story about P&G, but I, I jumped again too quick. By and calling sure, Johnson Johnson, you mean, or well, by getting the patent? Filing patents. Oh. Because I was scared, and and you never want to do something because of fear. You you really want to study um, a little bit more about the patenting process, uh, and that's what happened. I jumped again like everybody does. I've learned that lesson. Do your homework. Study the marketplace. There's there's going to be times to file patents, right? So, um, but but I had to find a way of uh, protecting it. Now, not all ideas you have to protect. Some of the big ones you do. And so I went down that road to learn as much as I can about the label industry. That's when I changed you know, and went to a different industry because of that one call. That one call said it all. Do you have a patent? And that was the green light that said, there's something here. And when a major company picks up the phone and shows interest, you know you got something. What yeah. was the original prototype? What did it look like or what was it for? Uh, it was. It wasn't um, very sophisticated. It doesn't have to be. You know, sometimes a good idea is just a good idea, right? But I built that sample on a, on a copy machine. I just took the label off and and just kind of pieced it together. I wasn't working with computers at that time, so I just hand cut it. It was really ugly, kind of, but it it showed the magic. And the magic was there was a base label and there's a label on top of it and when you would spin it, it would reveal all that extra information. It was so easy and elegant that you wondered, why hadn't anybody ever done this before? It was magical. And I saw it and other companies saw it quick, very, very quickly they saw it. Yeah. So we'll talk about that a little bit later with the, the uh, Procter & Gamble and ask about that. But I always like to find out one of the pivotal or biggest connections and and or milestones and I know you finally got into Walmart can you talk about a little bit about that yeah Walmart when we were selling the guitar picks we we had them at a lot of the small um, music stores and we were selling a lot of guitar picks but at the end of the day to really do the volume and to get the mass distribution a lot of us entrepreneurs dream of Walmart and I did too and sure enough, we were at a trade show and a gentleman walked by in the morning. Always get there early. If you ever do a trade show, always get there early because the big guys come early when it's very quiet. He came by 
And he had some product at Walmart, saw it, and said, look, let me represent you at Walmart. And I had no idea the magnitude of what that really meant. Because once we got involved with Walmart, we realized what the initial order was going to be. And the initial order was $400,000. We'd never done something. We weren't even doing that sales in a year. So we had to scale up very, very quickly. And that was a whole story in itself because you're never prepared for it. I mean, you just aren't. So you have to kind of grab it. We made a lot of mistakes along the way. We, we had a blast doing it. But at the end of the day, we shipped at Walmart. We were the number one best-selling small musical accessory with our girls' rock guitar picks at Walmart. And my daughter designed those <laughs> because she, she knew a little bit more about girls and fashion. So I, I, I stopped designing after I, my first designs didn't work. I, I, I went after um, the younger group to tell me what would work. So the Walmart was the big deal. Uh, we sold a lot of product. And I remember when that first truck pulled up. It was a 53-foot truck that pulled up in my little office. It could barely get in the driveway. In fact, the guy couldn't get out. He tore up <laughs> all these bushes to get out. I remember hand-loading these boxes and boxes at Walmart, and it was just a small fraction of the order. It was amazing. It so was, that truck was filled with guitar picks? Well, not all of it. Oh, okay. I was like, that's a lot of guitar picks. No. They, what they do at Walmart, they do a regional test and then they do a big one. But once it starts to work, um, you have to really be prepared. That means you have to build a lot of inventory. You have to float a little bit of money because it takes about 60 to 90 days to get your money back from the big retailers. Um, you can track it online, which is really beautiful. Uh, but uh, to see the sales, the magic is the resale coming back and we knew it see we knew it was going to work because we had built the same model with smaller stores so we knew what the packaging should be we knew the price point we knew everything because we had tested it enough at smaller stores and that's what people need to realize you just don't get to Walmart one day you have a lot of experience they're only going to deal with people that have a track record we had a track record and we had everything in place so when it hit Walmart it just worked again so it, it, it's not that you have to have a lot of experience, but you have to realize you need to test, you know, and test where it doesn't cost a lot of money. That's what I've learned. I learned that very early on selling at street fairs, test. I learned that at 7-Eleven and some of the other stores. Always test, 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 define it. And then once you're ready, trust me, if it works, people will be knocking on your door. Yeah, and that's great advice. I mean, but, you know, it's much... There's a lot that goes into that, even if you are experienced. And I remember reading somewhere like that I read that you thought it was a fun process, but that you lost a lot of weight in the process. <laughs> what was what was it what were you losing the most weight about or what was the most grueling from that process of when they were interested to actually shipping it? Because that's that's a lot of steps in between. You, you know, my background, if you look back, um, was really licensing ideas. Okay, coming up with ideas, showing it to a company, if they like it, they license it, and I don't have to do anything more. I don't have to worry about inventory, I don't have to worry about marketing, I'm not spending my money, right? right. So it's risk-free. I'm a risk-free entrepreneur. I don't like I don't I really don't like risk. I avoid it at all costs. So that was my that was my business model, right? And it, it worked very well until one day some royalties stopped. And there's another story there we can talk about. So I jumped in with these guitar picks, knowing nothing. I'm 50 years old. I know not one thing about running a business, about having employees, inventory, um, everything from QuickBooks to shipping, international shipping. Everything had to learn from scratch. And uh, I jumped in, and uh, it was nerve-wracking at first. But where I lost the weight was, was the Walmart, okay? Because I remember when I knew how large the order was going to be, and I started figuring out we needed more room. So I, I, went, out, I went out and got the storage unit, and I realized um, when the truck pulled up with all the stuff to build out the guitar picks, I, was, I didn't realize you had to walk around pallets, so I had to order like three more. And then I realized that they wanted it in 10 days, and, that, and I realized, well, I needed 100 people to build them out, and there was only five of us. 
and I started panicking a little bit, right? That I would panic a lot, actually. I, I did. I panicked a lot. And because yeah. it was all new. I mean, I, I'm here I'm driving tr big trucks myself with inventory and I've, and you know, we're, we're, we're hiring workers, but where it bothered me was the float of the money. You're right. I had no experience with the float. And so it, it, it didn't sit well with me. And looking back, I was just inexperienced. You know, I didn't realize that um, you float it, you, you either do factoring or because banks won't loan you money. There's, there's different ways of, of, of working with those purchase orders that come in. So we figured it out, but then the date, it didn't really, it wasn't the right fit for my personality. I ended up selling that business uh, a few years later and it still goes on today. It's very, very successful. So the, the business model was right. Learned a tremendous amount about, uh, uh, through that whole uh, process. But I realized my personality wasn't really the right fit for that type of project. Licensing was a little bit better fit for me. Got it. So I lost a lot of weight, yeah. Yeah. Worry. So go, what was the story about the royalty stepping that you were going to tell? The... Um, yeah, this is a story that a lot of people have told me. Don't tell this story, but I think a very real story. When I had licensed a rotating label and we had it, I had licensed it to a very large company and the minimum guarantees were very large. So my income was pretty substantial, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year. And it allowed me to do some really fun things. Um, number one, I'm not running a business. Someone else is doing all the work so I could take my family on vacations and I was just having a ball, you know, doing what I wanted to do. Well, that 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 eventually dried up. You know, it took you know five years, but it eventually stopped. And one day, um, it stopped. And I remember going into my office and telling the a very close person I work with that you know the business is kind of over. We we got to reinvent ourselves somehow. So, um, you know, you're 50 years old. Um, you have three kids going into college, and your wife's not working, you know, or working a little bit, and um, you've got to have to readjust a little bit, right? So I didn't, you know, you know, it's kind of very interesting about it. I didn't flip out. I just kind of relaxed, and I told the, the this guy that I've been working with forever. I said, "We'll figure this out. Just relax. We'll figure it out. I'm pretty clever." And that's when, like, Rob Stefani, you know, walked in with the guitar pick. And I thought, well, this is kind of fun. Let's see where it leads. And uh, we ended up um, selling tens of millions of guitar picks and uh, got right back on my feet very, very quickly. But I had, I had, you know, hitting rock bottom means different things to different people. So, um, but when your income stops and you really don't have any skills, you know, I don't, really don't have the typical skills. And, you know, I can barely you know, write notes down. And I mean, it's not like I'm going to get a job working for anybody. I knew that. So I had to create, I've always had to create my own jobs. Right. And, uh, and so I just kind of look at it and say, all right, where do we go from here? And take a deep breath. We figured it out and it worked. I mean, I guess that's the best thing that ever happened though. I mean, if it wouldn't have dried out, you probably wouldn't have had, maybe you wouldn't have taken that opportunity or maybe the opportunity wouldn't have come to you. But looking back, at that, is there anything that you could have done to keep it from drying out, or is it just in the hands of someone else at I, that point? I was inexperienced when that happened. Um, I didn't manage the, the product very well. I, gave, I licensed to a very large company and kind of just walked away, thought they would do everything. Well, they, it, it, it worked for a while. You know, we sold hundreds of millions of labels and, on national brands. and. I thought it was never going to end. Well, it did end. And um, so I walked away and reinvented myself. And it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Yeah. Two, two reasons why. Running the business, day-to-day -day business of a, a company, I, I learned a complete new skill set. Um, I also started talking about inventing. So I found my voice. That was another opportunity. But also um, what's happened I'm back in that business again. See, everything comes back around kind of. It's kind of interesting how that works because I got a call. I, I became a Disney licensee with the guitar picks, right? And we're selling Mickey Mouse guitar picks and we're selling Taylor Swift guitar picks. And 
I, be, I become this big Disney licensee and we've got an exclusive. And, and so I'm in a Disney meeting and my partner says, show them that spin label you have. So I showed the spin label and they were like, wow, we want this on a product of ours. I thought, no, not again. <laughs> and sure enough, we started back up again and they helped me take my technology and move it forward. Because they asked me, see what happened? Because one of the guys that was in the meeting, Disney is such a wonderful company too. He said to me, Steve, I saw this technology before. What happened to it? I said, well, the company that produced it, um, I gave them an exclusive license. They had some competing products. And it was just too expensive at the end of the day. So he said, well, do you have any new technology? And I said, yes, I do. So he goes, well, why don't we help you take that new technology and get it back on in the market again? So that's what they, Disney helped me do that. They were a good friend. In fact, I remember the person saying this to me. He said, Steve, you're home now. I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, your, your label tells a story. and We tell stories at Disney. And so we're going to help you now. And, and big businesses, you don't usually hear them say that, right? Uh, but there's some really wonderful companies out there. And they gave me a whole other start. And uh, sure enough, we got out there and Another company jumped on board with a product called AccuDial. When you spin the label, you can correctly dial in the correct dosage of your, for your child by the, the weight of your child, not by the age. Hmm. And we won an Edison Award along with Coke, along with Ford, Apple. We won one. Stephen Key won one in New York. That's amazing. And I got back in the business again. And then a company eventually bought my patent portfolio. And I'm back in it again. You can't so, get enough. Well, you know, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, I, I love products. I love innovation. Uh, I'm not the most creative guy, but I found a way of making it work for me. And uh, it's been a great experience. I love products. And the, the, what I tell everybody, it's really simple. Just go down to the store, look at products, and you'll see that you can do better. Because I looked at them, I go, that's not so great. And uh, yeah, and that's how it all started with me. No, not I don't really have a background in any of it. I'm just a consumer. So I think we're all experts. I think, but we're scared sometimes that we don't have experience, right? We're we're scared to fail. And right. I'm the biggest. I have the biggest fear in the world of failing. So, but with the right people, the right mentors, some of the right books, um, you can jump in because the water's fine. It really is, but you have to take the leap. I mean, it seems like, again, like everything you're doing is leading to something huge. Can you tell us one of those big pitfalls you wish you would have avoided or a big failure you had looking back? Um, I wouldn't, some of the, I would say the, I wasn't close enough to it, some of the details. I should have watched it a little closer. There were some very big opportunities. I had signed a licensing deal with Coca-Cola in Mexico, and we had some technical issues. And um, I made some bad decisions, and so it, it failed. Um, sometimes you have to tell a customer no, and I should have told Coke no, because I wasn't ready yet, and I didn't have the right partners yet. They were going to bring in their own team. It, but I knew that their team didn't understand this technology, so it failed. I should have stood up and said, no, I'm not ready yet. So sometimes you jump in too early because you're just excited and you don't think you're gonna get that opportunity again. Right. So that, that was a big mistake. So I, I, I've also learned this one thing. What will, what, what is, if something isn't meant to be, it's not gonna happen. I mean, you just have to kind of, relax about it and go, look, this isn't meant to be. I used to think that I could take all my will and make something happen. If I just worked longer, harder than the next guy, I could make this happen. I thought that forever, and I still believe part of that. But you still need to recognize that you have to be able to change quickly. You have to take input. You need to be persistent, but don't be too, uh, uh, don't be too, um, don't be too stubborn. Okay. Be able to mold, change, listen to other people, um, be flexible, um, accept failure as part of the process. Failure is not, not a bad thing. It's not, it's not a bad thing. You have to fail to succeed. So I've learned all those things now. Now I can apply it. I, I'm, I'm my mid-50s, and I look at my career just starting. You know, so 
Yeah, it's a new day for me, and I have huge mountains to climb. Yeah. What's one thing you tell the audience to do right now to start getting more sales, or even their first sale? I know mentorship is important to you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I I really believe in having people that have more experience than, than I do to, to somehow tap into their knowledge. And I have some very good friends. I have a mentor that helped me when I was in my early 20s, and he's still a very good friend, Steve Askin. Um, he, he told me I wasn't crazy when everybody said you're nuts. And he said, no, no, you're not nuts. Everybody else is nuts. You keep doing what. And he gave me the inspiration and um, just a, a sounding board, right? So um, I think having mentors is very, very important. Getting that first sale, I've got a quick story about that first sale. Yeah. Um, I was selling stuff at street fairs. And I wanted to sell them in stores, but I had never sold anything inside a store before. So I remember I loaded up my car and I put my, my stuffed animals in there and I went to the first store and I went up there and, and knocked, you know, went inside and the woman kind of looked at me and, and she realized I was new at this. She was very kind though. She gave me some language and she said, this isn't right for my store. So I went to the next door and they, they turned me down too. And so I thought, you know, so I, I went to the third store. And sure enough, I, and I was on the counter, and I could tell the guy was going to tell me no again. But there was a person at the counter there that looked at it and goes, well, what is that? So I, I took it out, and I started showing their little tomatoes with faces. I call them tom tomatoes. I showed it to her, and one said, I'll take three of those now. And the guy looked at me, and I sold them in his store, and then he said, I'll take two dozen. So, <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes... You have to um, take opportunity when it comes and, and realize that you just got to push through at times and, and learn and have fun with it. Uh, I've made all the mistakes and they're not really mistakes. They're stepping stones to success. What's one of the best advice, piece of advice that Steve has given you throughout the years, being your mentor and still is? Um, he's all about the sales. You know, he's really big into the sales and he's all about um, being able to scale things up too. You have to be able to scale it up. A lot of people don't realize that. And that's, that's been my goal is how do I go from a street fair to one little store, 10 stores to mass market to worldwide? It's all scaling up. And you have to realize that you start here, which is fine. Start small, build the bricks, understand it, and then understand where the next, next growth is. But realize and Steve was able to help me. He said, look, would, the, you know your success when your product is selling on the street corners of New York. That's what he always used to tell me. But what he was really telling me, find something that's scalable. Find something that people want. And, um, and you, you can make it happen. You're never going to have all the answers, right? And he's all about getting that first order. You need to get that first order under your belt. And then fight like crazy to get that product out the door. Always be able to ship. Um, people get sometimes it's not going to be perfect. Your product's never going to be excellent. Uh, it doesn't have to be. It can be 80% there, but you have to ship it. If you never ship it, you'll never make any money. So um, R&D is fun. Design's fun, but it's not your baby. It's a product. Get it, get it close to where it needs to be. Ship it. Ship it. Grab that money. Learn again and do it again. Just do it over and over again. Yeah. And, and, I, and, go ahead. and love it. Love it. Love your customer. And your customer will love you. And, and think about them first. And, and what, what would they like? And, and treat them that way. And they'll, especially today with all the social media, it comes, it comes out very, very clear when you love your customer. They, they will follow you and they'll be loyal to you. Yeah. I was going to ask about, I want to go back to that call you got when you mentioned to Procter & Gamble. Wow. Um, I had made some samples at Kinko's and showed it to a friend of mine that father was in the, the big corporate world of Procter and Gamble's in that world. And he saw my, my spinning label and he fell in love with it. He said, Steve, this is huge. Can I have a sample? So I gave him a sample and, and one day he was playing golf with the president and CEO of Procter and Gamble. And he pulled it out of his pocket, spun it the label and Dirk Yeager said, I want this guy in Cincinnati. So I got this call from the, the president's office at P&G, and I've got this little office, and I get this call saying he wants you out there. And I'm thinking, I hit the 
big time. So I told my wife, I said, look, this is way over my head, by the way. But you're in the marketing. You're, you're, you're vice president of marketing for Gala Winery. You speak the same language as these guys. You know what she told me? She said, Steve, forget it. Don't go there. This is not a good thing. And I said, I had met Janice at Worlds of Wonder. She was the smartest woman I've ever met. She wore this red dress. So my comment to her at the time, I said, Janice, you're going, you're going to put that red dress on and you're going to run that meeting for me. We went there. And right before we have the, the big meeting, this gentleman takes us out to lunch. And I thank him after lunch. We're walking across the grass, right? And the sun is hitting my face. And I finally realized I've hit the big time. It doesn't get any bigger. This is my time to shine in the, in the sunshine. And I said to the gentleman that took us out to lunch, I said, gee, you know, Joe, I forgot his name. And it's, thank you for lunch. And he said, Mr. Key, remember one thing. I said, well, what's that? He goes, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And my wife looked at me like, I told you so. So we went in this meeting and we walked down these walls of patents and patents and patents and patents. And we get to this one room and there's this long table and we're on one side, there's three of us, and there's 25, 30 guys on the other side, attorneys, you know, engineers, marketing people. And I get out there and I spin my little label and my wife gets up there and talks about some marketing and we have a manufacturing guy that tells how we're going to make it. And they don't say one word. There's not one smile in the whole place. And then this gentleman slides a piece of paper across the table. And he says, Mr. Key, we're not going to pay you one penny for this idea. And they all walk out. Meeting over. Lasted 10 minutes. And that piece of paper, I couldn't understand what that was. And I looked at it, and there were all these numbers. So I, I sent the, I faxed it over to my attorneys, all these numbers, and they said, you know, Steve, I'm really sorry, but the idea of your rotating label is not new. It was invented 50 years ago. Hmm. And, and you'll never get a patent on it. And we didn't know that when we were filing those patents for you. We didn't see, we see it. So he goes, you need to forget about it. So I couldn't understand something. I mean, here, my attorneys, some of the smartest guys in Silicon Valley, P&G's got their whole legal team. What am I missing here? Why wasn't this product on the shelf? So I read the patents of all these patents and I realized I didn't invent this, someone else did. Okay, got over that. But there was no method of how to manufacture it. Today, I've sold hundreds of millions of rotating labels. I have 13 patents. I've filed 13 more. I've defended it in federal court against a small toy company called Lego. We settled two weeks before it went to trial. I make a very good living with the rotating label when everybody told me no. So what did I learn there from that? I learned two things. Number one, if you really believe in something, do your own homework. Don't listen to anybody else. Do your own homework and understand why. Always ask why. And I knew if this product wasn't on the shelf, and it's still not on the shelf in some limited places, I still barely have scratched the, even though we sold hundreds of millions, it's, it's barely been anywhere. That's my mountain to climb. I'm still in the technology, but you have to trust your own gut. Get some good people to help you, but realize, ask questions. Always ask questions. Why, why, why is it on the store shelf? Why didn't this happen? Where everybody was so quick to just discard it, I stuck with it and it's, it's changed. It's been a life changer for me. That's a great story. Yeah. So what, what did you patent then? The manufacturing process? Yeah. Huh. And I still file patents. Um, we still had one just got, I started filing in 1999 and I'm still filing today. Same technology. Because it changes. And another thing I've learned too, and I didn't know this before. If you have something that's working, keep on innovating. Don't be happy. Look ahead. Keep on looking ahead because it will change. Everything changes. So, so you'll have highs and lows, but always innovate looking ahead at what the customer wants. So now we have labels that you spin it. They'll, they'll give you the correct dosing by the weight, not by the age. We've got these great spin cups that you're going to see in fast food restaurants. They're going to be coming out soon. I mean, that's easier said than done, though, because when, especially when it's successful, 
you like you do with the other licensing deals, you could kind of sit back and you almost relax. So how do you or anyone else tell anyone else out there to not sit on your laurels and keep innovating, keep, you know, forging ahead? How do you do that when you can kind of sit back and relax? Well, if number one, I, I realized that um, if you really want to protect your interest and stay ahead of everybody else, you, you have to keep innovating. Any business today, um, if they want to keep to be in business, they have to innovate today. Things change very, very quickly. So it's something I think I've learned, a lot of companies have learned. The successful companies are always innovating right now because they always have to be one step ahead. Not only filing IP, intellectual property, but where is the technology going? And so today I realized that um, now it's now it's fun because I can try to think a little bit differently and, and be creative differently. I don't really come up with any new types of products, but creatively I think of how to protect it, how to manufacture it. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's it never ends. So you just keep keep ahead. If if you stop the day you stop innovating, it's the day um, you can mark on your calendar you will go out of business. I'm gonna. I have a question. One last question for you about that and your goals still. But before I ask, I want you to tell us a little bit more about your business and what you're working on now. Uh, that's exciting. Okay, I had mentioned that I got pulled back in for the rotating label. After all these years, I, I, I completely did something else. I got pulled back in. I said yes, I'll do it. Sold my company, and now they brought me back in to um, to develop more IP, intellectual property, to develop manufacturing processes, to, to work my technology so it's scalable now. Not just one guy, but myself, living in, you know, licensing, walking away. How do we build a major company around the technology? That's my goal today. How can we put it on prod, products that sell billions? And there's some of those guys that do sell that much. I mean, they sell a billion Cokes a day. How do we scale it? It's all about scalability. Remember I said about Steve Askin said, how do you scale it? That's the mystery now. How do you scale the business? How do you scale the product? How do you, how do you creatively figure all those things out? That's what I'm working on today. So um, today is the start of my career. Every day is. So I look back and it's been a wonderful ride. I've learned so much, but I've just, I'm just beginning. Yeah, I mean, I feel like how you scale it is you go into that one store and you sell three tomatoes, tomatoes to someone, and you figure out what people like, right? Yeah, but then you have to feel. Uh, then you have to figure out. Well, how do I get to a store in New York, and how do I sell to someone in Japan, and how do I manufacture it to get it to be a little bit lower cost so I can hit the WalMarts, and how do I protect it to keep some of the competition out from knocking on my door, and how do I run it on new equipment? And, and how do I tie in social media now to my labels? And how do I tie in QR codes and game pieces? It just gets, it just, it's, it's, it's really a creative challenge, which is kind of um, uh, daunting, but also um, it can be done. And I also like to tell everybody, any project you take on, uh, take one bite at a time, okay? And, um, I, what I do is that I have a list. Every day I make a list of everything I want to do. And I make it so I can actually get those things done. So I can scratch them off. Um, because at the end of the day, when I scratch off all these things, at the end of the week, I've really, I really have done a lot. Right. So scale it back down to what can I do today? What can I do next week? What can I do from a month? And manage it that way. Because sometimes some of this becomes so overwhelming. Where do I start? I don't, I'm so overwhelming. I don't know where to start at all. Start small. Right. I, I believe in one simple idea is all about starting small, about three things. If, if you can start small, it's going to be easy to inventory, it's going to be easy to raise money, and it's going to be easy to manage. Start small. Build your wall with one brick at a time and uh, have fun with it. You know, and you can do this. And it, it comes out of the most likely people. I never thought I would be an author. I never thought I'd be talking about innovation. I never thought I'd be working on the same thing for over 15 years and really enjoying it. So uh, find something you really love, hang on to it, find a good mentor and uh, find your passion. I want to find out 
what your goals are still because you mentioned you're, you're just getting started. But first, tell us where people can find more if they want to reach out and thank you or find more information about your book and your company. What are the, the sites they should check out? Yeah, well, well, thank you. Um, you can always you can always go to um, invent right. That's I N V E N T right R I G H D. You want to invent right, not wrong. Very simple. And we have a lot of videos that people can watch. Um, we have a directory there too that you can join. And there's there's fourteen hundred companies that are looking for ideas. You'll see them all up there. Those are companies that are open to ideas. They love to see them. Uh, and we have a lot of videos that just talk about the process. It's absolutely free. If if you want to learn a little bit more about licensing, there's one, my first book called One Simple Idea. It's a yellow one. Um, it's been, um, it's done very well. It's being translated in five different languages. It just got translated in Chinese and Korean and German and some other ones as well. And my second book is One Simple Idea for Startups. It's how to start a small company, how to become profitable and how to stay ahead and, and really how to how to outsmart the competition. I love it. Uh, so those are two books you can find. They're very easy to read and I think you're going to walk away being very empowered. Okay, and that's what they're really there for. Um, my goals now... Well, hold on, before you say that, that okay. the, the book is on a different website, I believe. It's on your your name, right? Yes. Yeah, StephenKey.com. Yeah, you can always go to Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot com, Stephen Key. We have a site that shows one simple idea of the yellow book. Yeah. I want to make sure people check that out because I read it. It's great. And actually, um, one of the things that prompted me to ask you to, to speak is actually there was an audience member that said you need to have Stephen Key and you need to talk to him. And I had already read your book at that point. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's wonderful. But um, so check out his both those sites. It's great information. I've watched many of the videos. So tell us what you're getting and starting, and what are the goals still that you still have to accomplish? I am learning some things today. I'm I'm, I'm actually embarrassed to say this. Um, I am. You know, I'm 56 years old. Still young. Yeah, I think so. But I'm learning things today that um, are shocking to me. I'm I'm working with a team of people that are very bright, it's much smarter than I am. They have a different skill set, and they're, I'm learning so many things. Um, they've they have run big companies. Um, their their goal is to take this technology I have and, and turn it into a very large company. So they're, I'm learning about how to put together um, op, you know standard operating procedures in place of how to scale it. See, it comes back to scaling again. Um, how to transfer my knowledge to other people so we can implement our technology in, in, in different areas. Um, so it's really trying to duplicate something to, to more people. So that, that was a very interesting learning curve. Looking at all my intellectual property and finding holes in it, where I thought I'd filled all the holes and they were very very determined to say, no, you haven't. We don't know there's holes, but we know they're there. You go find them. And I didn't like that attitude, but they were right. And I found them. They were really right. To to how to put together a, a, just procedures in place that to really grow a company from a $10 million to $100 million company. That's what I'm learning today. How to grow it, how to scale it. So I've got a lot of people telling me what to do. And I haven't had a lot of people ever tell me what to do. And, and it's hard for me, you know, it's hard for me to listen and to accept it because sometimes I think when you become an expert is when you start, you stop learning. Okay. So I, I'm trying to be very patient, learn from others, trying to help them learn. Um, and I guess growing up a little bit, I hate to say that, but tr I live in a, um, a very different world than most people. I, I love what I do. I can be playful. I can... And some of it's real business, but I kind of run my own destiny. Right. For the first time, it's in the hands of others. And so we work as a team. And teamwork, and one thing I forgot to mention earlier, never, be, never get stuck. Right? You don't have to get stuck in anything that you do. Find a team member or a mentor that can fill the, the gaps of your knowledge for you and move forward. Don't ever let that stop you just because something you know what to do. And, and you should never... Um, get stuck 
and so many people do. So um, I'm on a very different path. I like it. I'm learning. It's frustrating as can be. <laughs> and um, my my kids said I won't last six months with this group. And it's already been a year and a half. Okay, so they're wrong. wrong. I'm very proud that I'm still hanging in there <laughs> tough. I pull my hair out. I've got to go for walks every once in a while. And uh, and it's 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 new for me. That's great. No, and I, I just want to be the first one to thank you, Stephen, for sharing your knowledge with us. And everyone should go check out stephenkey.com uh, and eventright.com and just say thank you because this is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, so thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me, Jeremy. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.